Um, here we are. And okay, so uh, we're we're it's wonderful that we get to welcome Nika Simonovich Fisher today uh, for our CD lecture series, where this is the second of the fall semester of 2022. Uh, uh, it is super special for, for me to be introducing her because Nika was actually my student a thousand years ago uh, and she's, she's had a whole, a few different lifetimes since, but I'll tell you a little bit about that before we begin so you can see where she's coming from, but she was once uh, a Parsons student as well. So uh, Nika Simovich Fisher is a Serbian born American raised graphic designer, writer and educator based in New York. Her written work explores how design and identity overlap and highlights underreported voices in internet and design history. Her words have appeared in publications in, including the New York Times and AIGA Eye on Design. In 2018, she co-founded Laboud, Laboud, right? Uh, a design studio specializing in strategy, branding, and web design for clients across fashion, art, and tech. She's an assistant professor of communication design at Parsons School of Design woo, and previously taught at the University of Pennsylvania and Rutgers University. Nika holds a master's degree from Columbia University's journalism school and a BFA in communication design from Parsons School of Design. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Nika to also pronounce your studio's name correctly and uh, you, can, you can take it away. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for the introduction, Juliet, and um, thank you all for coming here today at 3 p.m. on a Friday. Very much appreciate it. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. Um, great. Well, thanks so much for being here. And as Juliet mentioned, I was also a student at Parsons, and now I work here. So it, it's always very special for me to come and um, speak about my work, um, just because it feels um, like it's part of my personal history. So the, um, the presentation I'm going to share with you today is called Histories in Progress. And um, I think of history, I chose this title because I think of graphic design as a framework that can help you visualize and document the passage of time. And I think um, your own histories can make their way into a more global history as well. Um, and doing so has really helped me have uh, more of a personal connection to my work, both as a designer and a writer. So I'd like to start with this question, which is what does it mean to have a historical context in your work? Um, this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about because I'm currently teaching a design history and uh, practice class. And I think there is more to it than just knowing a bunch of names of designers uh, memorized. I think it's a lot deeper than that. Um, and I think a tangential question is what even is design history and whose history is it? Because for a long time, um, the histories that were documented, um, maybe you don't identify with personally, and even though you can learn from them, they're not very inclusive. And so I think thinking about your own life um, as a sort of, kind of a source material for that could be an interesting um, starting point. So I'll start with my own history. Um, I was born in Yugoslavia in 1991, and Yugoslavia is a country that no longer exists. Um, and even though I, uh, I moved when I was a toddler, um, I still have like an affinity towards Yugoslavia and identify with that as part of my culture. And one of my first meaningful experiences with design was actually being at an airport and um, handing over my Yugoslavian passport and not, them not being able to find um, Yugoslavia in the interface. Um, so I was told that that country does not exist, which is a really funny and kind of flat way of saying that um, the software doesn't accommodate for countries that have been renamed or have um, kind of evolved over time. Um, but it was interesting, this, like, this statement, because it made me think about erasure and how design can kind of highlight um, or um, highlight or remove different voices sometimes. So the reason Yugoslavia didn't show up was because the country dissolved um, in my lifetime. And in my lifetime, it went through different phases where it was known as Yugoslavia. Serbia and Montenegro, and then finally Serbia. And the reason it was going through so many changes were there were a lot of political um, moments within the country that were kind of causing the country to dissolve. Um, there were a lot of events and political turmoil um, connected to the end of communism in the country and uh, a lot of political uprisings that were um, rooted in political tensions and racism within the borders of the country. And so 
um, a lot of events happened and it eventually uh, collapsed. And these photos actually come from my dad who was working as a photographer um, in the late 80s and 90s in Belgrade. And so he was documenting some of these um, really tumultuous moments in the country um, that inspired us to, to move. Um, and these photos are both from the same year, 1999. So on the left is a photo of Belgrade um, during the NATO bombings um, that were happening in retaliation um, to the Kosovo War and the Bosnian genocide. And on the right is a picture of myself from this time period on a canoe in um, St. Louis, Missouri. And um, this time period was particularly confusing for me growing up because um, I was being told that Yugoslavia was this really great country and we had so much affinity to it. And it was, I was told that this was like my home, home homeland and, um, and connect for, had a personal connection to it. Um, but then I had left when I was a toddler and I was growing up in the United States and felt very American. And also we were never talking about these kind of terrible um, events that were happening back home that were impacting my extended family, even though I was aware that they were going on, it was just not a conversation that was being um, out in the open. I think sometimes when there's a traumatizing event, um, it doesn't get talked about meaningfully. And so this was very confusing for me at this time period. Also kind of extending that idea of confusion, um, I spoke a different language at home than I did everywhere else. And so I think of this as a gift now, but at the time I did feel a little isolated because I didn't know very many Serbian people in St. Louis, Missouri, and then later in the Bay Area in California. Um, so I would always go home and kind of have this alternate world where I was speaking one language and then having all of these other experiences where I was growing and developing a rich vocabulary in another. And so even though I'm fluent in both, I feel much more confident in English um, because I went to school here and everything. But I think this idea of having two different uh, ways of speaking is actually really interesting, um, an interesting parallel to design because you're always taking one idea and translating it for another audience. And sometimes you're remixing it a little, um, but this idea of kind of reinterpreting something is really true to my practice. And I think it does stem from this foundational moment I had growing up. Um, in another way, I was participating in these online worlds during this time period when I was growing up. Um, so this is a screenshot of actually my editorial debut um, on Neopets.com from 2001. And during these years when I was growing up, I was very active um, on these different online sites. Um, I had a lot of pen pals that I would correspond with and I spent a lot of time on different forums. It's like on a Sonic Youth forum, um, the Teen Vogue forum. Um, and Neopets as well. And if you're unfamiliar with Neopets, um, it was an online community where you took care of virtual pets. Um, some of these pets are depicted on this page. And um, it was a really interesting community for children because they really encouraged you to kind of participate with the content um, and submit your own um, writing and artwork to it. I also learned to use HTML and CSS on this platform because you were encouraged to customize your pet's profile pages. And yeah, as I mentioned, I submit a story called Chia or Cheeseburger, um, which was about uh, like a carnivorous animal um, that has a lot of guilt eating meat. Um, so that, that's what I submitted and that was uh, my first ever published piece. Um, and I'm skipping ahead a few years, but um, after a few detours and trying out um, one university, seeing it wasn't a great fit, and then um, working in retail for a little while and thinking about what I wanted to do, I ended up transferring to Parsons. Um, and it was really such um, a change of scenery and a welcome new world for me. Um, growing up in the suburbs, I hadn't really seen design talked about in such an integrated way. And at Parsons, it just felt like um, design was very much embedded into um, not just the culture of the school, but the city and the world. And like finding these different parallels between everything was very inspiring to me. Um, some of you might be working on this project right now in thesis, um, but this is something I did. And it's a project called 256. And it's 256 images that inspire you for whatever reason, and you are meant to assemble them in a meaningful way. And 
Part of what was interesting to me about my time at Parsons was that I was really encouraged to speak about my lived experience and highlight that visually. Um, I had a lot of interests that I didn't really think were very serious interests, like fashion and um, online communities, um, MySpace, kind of like mall interests, I felt like. I didn't think of them as serious academic pursuits. And I was never actually encouraged to really um, talk about how they're interesting or how maybe they reflect um, contemporary visual culture. And so at Parsons, even with an assignment that was as simple as this one, it was very interesting to see this kind of content that I was very familiar with get elevated into a printed page. Um, and it made me take my work a little bit more seriously and made me feel like even the things that I'm just casually browsing and interested in could be part of a bigger story. And so that was very exciting to me. And I think something else I took away is that anything can be visual research and anything can be um, visual history too. Um, so while I was at Parsons, I made a lot of web projects. So this is from um, Core Interaction and it was a piece called Publish versus Posted. And I compared um, statistics from Harper's Magazine to, um, to Twitter. And so I had like a live feed of the same topics that were brought up in um, this published piece to what people were saying um, online. Um, and so you can see that here. And I was just really interested in the kind of dichotomy of what an editor thought was important and worthy of print versus the ways that people were communicating in a more um, the kind of um, a casual way, I guess you could say, using slang and hashtags. And keep in mind, this was in 2012, so this was fairly new. Um, so I just thought that was a really interesting way of looking at visual culture and using design to highlight that. This is another screen um, from that project. You can see that you could categorize, um, you could sort by the different categories as well as the index numbers. Um, you also might observe that the, the way this looks emphasizes the content. All the design decisions just highlight um, the individual pieces and the colors are just used to depict um, different types of content. Um, it's very pulled back. And so part of that design language is rooted in what the web capabilities were at that time period. Um, you know, we didn't have custom web, uh, web fonts in 2012, or they weren't used in a widespread way. Um, but it was also very much rooted in the Swiss international style. So here we're seeing Joseph Mueller Brockman and Armin Hoffman's work. Um, and it's a very powerful design language. Um, when I first saw it, I was really impressed by how much it commanded your intention, uh, attention. And I was also interested in the kind of philosophy behind it that um, stemmed after World War II and was about neutrality. I also, a lot of the designers that I admired while I was at school um, utilized this visual language. And it was very different from sort of like my natural taste. And so what was interesting to me was sort of the shift in power. Um, when you design things in this way, it's, it felt like people could, um, they took your work more seriously. Like it gave um, your content this kind of really strong, austere form. Um, and so I kind of had this power trip where I just designed everything in this um, style. And like, that was the only thing I was interested in for a short moment. But that being said, I think this is a very um, striking visual language that was important in, in history. However, um, I also think that it's rooted in kind of a flawed idea of neutrality. I don't think it's possible to be neutral in design. Also, um, this is very much rooted in um, European and masculine um, aesthetics. And I think that while it does command a lot of attention, um, that's not the only way to command attention and have power in design. And that's something I'd like to come back to later on in my presentation. So after Parsons, I went on to work at a variety of different studios, agencies, and brands. So you can see a few of them here. And um, actually this idea of the Swiss international style and sort of being removed from the content kind of um, was very apparent in a lot of these places, not just because of the way things looked, but also because when you're working for a corporation, um, you yourself are not having kind of a personal connection with it. You're always making a form that's meant to be a container for something else often to buy things. And I thought all of these experiences were fantastic. However, um, I really craved a design practice that was a little bit more personal and um, had, that I had a little bit more control over. Um, I was also interested in exploring if there was a design language that could feel softer and more poetic, but equally as powerful as some of the moves that we saw um, previously. So in 2018, I started Labud with um, web developer Dylan Fisher. 
And this is the landing page for my practice. Um, I also see it as an analogy for some of my views on web design. So um, if you look at this, at the bottom of the screen, there are different dates, and then there's arrows that you can toggle and go through the different um, moments in time. So when a user lands on this website, um, they see a rock garden, and um, the user can contribute to that rock garden by clicking, and then a mark is saved on the page, and it gets stored for 24 hours. I think this represents my design philosophy because there's a playful and colorful system, but there's a set of instructions that are more important almost in the way it looks. Um, the, the, the kind of controls and the behind the scenes decisions are there, but the user can then input it and kind of change it and evolve it with time. And so it's not just like a static thing. Um, it's actually almost more about the instructions that I created to house that design. And with my client work, I also like to think about um, how you can develop a story through interaction and bring in a little bit more meaning um, to the work. So this is a monogram I designed for Abakashi, which is a fashion label run by Sheena Sood. Um, Sheena has very eclectic garments that reference her South Asian, Asian heritage, along with early 2000s nostalgia and memory of her travels. So this monogram is loosely inspired by a bindi, and it's also designed in a way that reminds me of the store Limited 2. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but um, when I was growing up, it was a popular place where you could get like silky pajamas and, and glitter makeup. And it was very much um, like Lizzie McGuire and uh, this very kind of cultural um, touch point that I think resonates with kind of girlhood in the United States. And it resonated with Sheena as well, because we we're about the same age. Um, so while working on this project, um, I looked at a lot of content from that time period. And so here are some examples of things that I referenced. Um, on the left, we see Adelia's ad. Um, on the right, we see the Macarena. And then up at the top, you see a 3D graphic. Um, and so all of these things inform the visual language. But I want to note that just looking at something from the past is not enough. It's not like you're recreating something that has been already um, created in the past. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, when you're referencing history, you need to update it so that it makes sense today and re reinterpret it for a modern audience. And not only that, but you really need to think about the content and how you can make something meaningful with what you're saying. And so, um, I, so even though the idea of um, 2000s nostalgia was apparent to Sheena in her fashion, um, fashion garments, it was more important that there was about her memory and her own kind of experience with that and how, and she's very involved with her um, production methods too. And so to highlight that, I really wanted to bring in Sheena's voice to the site. And to do that, I did it very literally by actually putting it at, in on the homepage. So the next page is a little noisy, but you'll hear her voice. Uh... We used audio throughout the website to communicate that, to bring in a little bit more of her, um, of the individual behind the garments into the website. Um, I also thought about how we can create more of um, a, a metaphor throughout the site as well. So throughout the site, when you hovered over the products, um, the, my web developer and I uh, landed on this solution where um, the page actually gets dip dyed. So, the color palette is constantly evolving instead of being static. And then as you can see here, each, um, each, um, each product get, receives its own color treatment on the interior pages. Um, and then in other projects, my visual references can be a little bit more literal. Um, so this is Microsoft Bob, which was created by Microsoft in 1995. And it only lasted for a year, but it was an experimental approach to interface graphics. Um, at the time, desktop um, computers were still not that widespread. And so um, Microsoft decided to try to create a metaphor that was a little bit more similar to um, a person's home. And then you could click on different things um, and, and learn how to use um, the digital kind of um, the digital thing with it. So like if you clicked on the calendar, you would see a calendar, for example. And there was this little dog that would guide you through each room. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't really take off, but I think it's a really interesting idea um, because we have all of these uh, metaphors that we still use in interface graphics, like folders 
in pages. And so um, it's curious that something that was even more literal uh, just didn't wasn't as effective. But um, I brought this into a project when Russet, um, which is a homeware company, asked me to design a microsite for a new product, which was a table. And they really wanted to lean into this idea of a website as a physical space. And so I will show you what um, I created. It was called Russet Crib. Um, and if you are a little John fan, um, that song that plays at the end is called Get Low. <laughs> um, but anyways, this I really leaned into this idea of a house um, and visualized it using the brand's illustrations. And then we added in feedback using uh, kind of lo-fi audio components that kind of juxtapose something that feels very um, like cute and put together with something that feels a little bit more abstract, kind of posing a question like if it's a real house or not. Um, but I think that it was just interesting to kind of think about how you could use um, this as a very literal space online. Um, I also thought about uh, how a website could be a space in a different way for Parsons in 2020. So what we're looking at is the Parsons Festival website that happened um, during the pandemic. And so we were asked to create uh, an online party for the, the exhibition and we really wanted to find a way to celebrate together and because we weren't able to do that because of COVID. And so I created these different um, balloons and gestures that were happening in real time. So if I play this video one more time, you can see that I'm controlling it on one screen, but it's happening everywhere. And so each school had its own balloon. And so when each um, program graduated, you could visit the website and then you could see the different programs celebrating together, which felt like a very special way of um, bringing um, people together in a time when we couldn't. And then I also, we also use the data to tell a story of how many parties were hosted and kind of leaning into that metaphor. And this type of language really speaks to sort of an earlier iteration of the internet um, where things were a little bit more direction-based and casual. And so this is an example of that from um, 1998. This was something called X Pages, which is sort of like a website generator. And um, I personally love things like this because they remind me of my own childhood and these kinds of more expressive moments of web design. But um, I would like to mention that, you know, things have evolved for a reason. Um, one aspect about that is accessibility. Um, this is really hard to read. Um, and it's also not going to appeal to a wide audience. And so even though I have sort of an affinity towards this, it's not always an appropriate solution to a project. And so that was something I was considering when I worked on Open Style Lab, which is a nonprofit organization um, that creates fashionable garments for people of a wide range of abilities. And um, I really wanted the site to have an editorial feeling to it, but also be um, uh, to use kind of accessibility as an anchor for that. And so um, we noticed when we were interviewing people that sometimes people zoom into a website. And so we wanted to remove that friction and use that magnifying component as part of the design, um, the design decisions. We also use, um, made it very accessible by allowing uh, for controls with the keyboard and being able to skip, with the, uh, skip to different parts of the content with your keyboard. And then after interviewing people who have uh, very uh, various abilities that range from our own, we learned that they actually would prefer a quicker experience. And so we incorporated a read-only version of the site to where users who are either using screen readers or the keyboard can actually quickly find what they're looking for without um, the rest of the design. And so that was really interesting to know because I wouldn't have known that had I not done the user testing. 
And so again, you can have your own experiences, but then reaching out to other people who have different when you're designing, I think that helps you create something that's both historically relevant, but also appropriate for the audience. Um, and then in here, I'm showing a mo custom module that we created that used um, native HTML video captions layered on top of an audio playing, uh, auto, auto playing video which um, was nice because it uses the default functionality of code. So it's not bringing in a, like a library or something that might not work um, in a few years and just keeping it very simple and lightweight because screen readers prefer that, that aspect of HTML, but then visually um, layering it so that it looks a little bit more editorial and you can hear, um, you, can, you can sort of imagine what the person is saying if you're not able to hear it. Um, and then this is a personal site that has been beta for five years and will probably stay that way forever. Um, but it's called Little Chefs and it's a quiet social network and recipe website where um, I um, we created something where you can store your recipes and then also put them in your own words. Um, I created it because um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience when you're cooking, but sometimes um, recipes live on these kind of nuanced personal blogs where there's like a personal essay about living in the Hamptons or something and being like a good mother um, before you get to the actual content. And I find it very slow to, to get to that. So I think um, I just wanted something that was a little bit more um, straightforward, but also rooted in my own memories with cooking, um, which, which I'll show you in a moment. But this is what the homepage looks like. And then um, these are some of the people that have created recipes and uploaded them. And we borrowed ideas from programming. So for example, we use the word fork as kind of a pun. Um, you can take a recipe and fork it, which just means you're going to take a recipe and modify it slightly. And so it kind of creates this community aspect to cooking um, without, um, without like having comments or things like that, that are more uh, directly social. Like this way it kind of makes an archive of the evolution of a recipe slowly. And this was my original reference. Um, so my memories from cooking are, are seeing my mom pull out these different um, pamphlets that were produced in tabloids in um, Yugoslavia in the late eighties and nineties. And this is what they look like. Um, they were produced very quickly and I just always appreciated this kind of um, like fast visual language and I wanted to bring that into the site, but I didn't want to abandon my idea of having something that was more straightforward. So I just used kinds of these types of typography within, um, uh, within the headlines and then had everything else feel a little bit more direct and pulled back. Um, and so I very much enjoy designing websites and having a client-based practice, but it's always about communicating someone else's content for the most part. And I've been thinking a lot about how I can evolve my design practice to be less of a response, as in not just a finite thing that's finished, and more of a dialogue. Um, and I've also been thinking about how design can highlight connections to communities, time, and people that go beyond my own lived experience, too. So... Um, that inspired me to go um, back to school, and I went to um, Columbia University's journalism school, which you are seeing here. And in graduate school, I became really interested in profiles. Um, if you are unfamiliar with a profile, it's a long format written feature that kind of focuses on an individual or a community and goes into a lot of detail about their upbringing and their life and how it informed um, the way they approach um, their, how, how it informs their worldview and how it approaches, you know, whatever it is that they've done. And then there's usually, there's more of like a point to it too. Like, why is this interesting or relevant to a wider audience? Um, and so it was an interesting way of thinking about design um, as a way of writing a profile because you're using words instead of uh, graphics. But um, I became very interested in this idea of writing profiles about people that hadn't been recognized um, historically in terms of graphic design. And we're looking at the website for Loretta Staples, who is a therapist currently, but previously had a very interesting life as a graphic designer um, in the early uh, 90s. Yeah, in the 90s. And um, I knew of her because she wrote this really influential text called Typography in the Screen that I often assign to my students. And then when we present about her, she has sort of this mysterious web presence where she has this website that has been um, in its current form for like 20, 30 years. But then there's not, it's difficult to find a lot of new information about her. So I was just very intrigued. 
And I do a lot of research on people just for fun sometimes. And I realized that I could give that more of a purpose by writing about it and seeing like why these things interest me enough to research them. Um, and then like, instead of just keeping that information to myself, sharing it with other people. So this is a page from that um, publication I mentioned from 2000, it's called Typography in the Screen. And uh, it kind of documents what, how typography changed in a digital landscape. And so it's one of the only documents from that time period. So it's very fascinating to hear who was behind this text and why they felt it was important to share. And it culminated into a piece um, that was published in the New York Times. And through getting to know her, I learned about, a lot about Loretta Staples and how um, she sort of went through a lot of different feelings about graphic design that were very personal. Um, she really enjoyed working as one in the 80s and 90s. She felt like she was designing this new world, but of being a woman of color in Silicon Valley, she felt like she, her voice wasn't heard and she didn't feel um, equally represented. And it kind of turned into this bigger discussion about design and how design can be homogenous. And when it becomes homogenous, it kind of um, erases different people, different people's perspectives and kind of becomes an only option instead of one option of many. And so I thought that was really powerful. And I think that by getting to know someone one-on-one -on -one and hearing their story, it makes you appreciate and look at graphics in a very different way. And hearing how she took that philosophy and applied it to um, various careers, including um, therapy, which she does now, it just really resonated to me how she used design as a way of making meaning in her life. Um, and through getting uh, after doing that experience, I became really interested in reflecting on um, some of my own experiences and kind of going back to Yugoslavia and thinking about typography there. And I realized that at the time I couldn't really think of a single um, Serbian type designer, which was uh, which bothered me. And so I started thinking about um, the alphabets that are used in Serbia. So Serbia uses a um, Serbian Cyrillic alphabet as well as the Latin text that has custom characters embedded in it. Um, but um, I ended up doing a lot of research on this and finding um, a woman named Olivera Stojadinovic, who was very involved with creating custom Serbian typefaces that had the Cyrillic um, in, in created in it. And so this is um, a photo of her and she spent a lot of her life um, doing that and working as a professor in Belgrade and when she first started out, um, she actually was uh, tasked with creating um, Serbsky Times, which translates to Serbian Times. Um, and that was basically an update to Times New Roman, which was the web default at the time, um, but just kind of layering in the different characters in place of other ones. And so even though um, she did, did this, she felt like it wasn't the right move because it was taking um, another person's artwork essentially, and then just kind of remixing it slightly instead of creating something that was wholly Serbian. And so I thought that was really interesting too, because um, I noticed that a lot of these um, technology or gaps in technology were from a Western um, world um, and in, in, in other places, not just Serbia, um, there, were, uh, there weren't a lot of options typographically to represent that voice. Um, and I also looked at a lot of primary source documents when I was working on this piece. Um, and one of the people I interviewed shared a database of, um, of websites created at a university in the 90s. And so this is one of those websites I found. And you can see here that it's using something called Yuski character encoding. Um, and what that was, was it was essentially a hack to represent um, the correct Serbian characters when you typed it out. But what it did was it replaced um, punctuation marks like curly braces or slashes with the correct marks. And you had to have a font that had the Yuski character encoding in it to see it. And so here, um, this is like a zoomed in version detail of the site. You can see that um, there's a curly brace in, um, in the place of a character. And so again, kind of noticing that, that um, the Western bias where it's, um, we're seeing something that's optimized for English um, and a, a regular Latin alphabet, and we're not having the ability to, to represent the language to its full potential. Um, and then this has been since repaired, but this was really interesting and it kind of highlights why there are um, fewer Serbian typefaces perhaps um, than, than, non, uh, than, than English ones. Um, also in my writing, I've looked at my more recent history too. So um, you're looking at the screenshot of Redwood High School, which is 
um, the high school I attended from 2005 to 2009. And it was an interesting time period when I was in high school. So this was around um, the time that Facebook was getting really big and the internet was becoming a lot more templatized and standardized, but there were still these traces of um, an earlier iteration of the web that was more similar to my Neopets days. And so um, this website was interesting because it was run by um, an individual named Dave Goldsmith, who was the computer lab instructor, as well as the students who were in his class. And they would learn to code together. He actually had taught himself to code. He was actually a geometry teacher before that, and then teach the students. And they used the website as this um, amazing like publishing space. And so they would come up with different ideas to put on the site. Like it, there was a page about the library. There was a page about um, trivia, about Redwood and so forth. And so as you can see from here, there wasn't really like a tight system. Um, there's a lot of different typefaces and, and link styles and everything, but it was very iterative and it really was a product of um, the students. But it was also a very contentious website um, at the time that I was at school, um, like the school district really didn't like it. They didn't feel it looked professional enough and they felt like it wasn't um, indicative of the kind of brand they wanted to have for this school in the suburbs of California. And so they eventually changed it. But I think of it as this like moment and memory that I have that was really part of this broader discussion on how the internet was changing. And so I actually reached out to Mr. Goldsmith who has since retired. Um, and talk to him for a piece. And what was curious about getting to know him was that he definitely did not consider himself a graphic designer. He saw himself as a geometry teacher and then a computer lab teacher and um, just really didn't see himself as a graphic designer. But what I see is a really amazing graphic, um, a piece of graphic design history. Um, I think that it highlighted this kind of um, last, uh, last breath of this early internet uh, moment. And I think he was creating this communal publishing um, outlet that empowered young people who maybe also wouldn't consider themselves graphic designers to publish something and inform a visual language. And so I think it's really powerful when you think of your own experiences with visual culture, how you can recontextualize whose voices are heard and what even is graphic design. And so you can see this full article um, here, it's um, published on Ion Design. And it's called Early Web Design, How the Generation Express Themselves Online. How do you recapture that feeling again? And I'd like to end with this quote um, from Sara Maza in um, the book, Thinking About History. It says, history changes all the time because it's dri driven by the concerns of the present. I think this is so important because um, in the past, history has been documented by different people and it sort of almost becomes like an arbitrary decision that some people decided that something was important or out of all of the things that were happening, that's what gets represented. And I think it's always going to be changing and there's always options and different things that were happening um, in a similar timeline. And so I would love to encourage everyone to look at their own lived experience and reflect on it because um, all of that is important and all of it can, can inform your visual practice and also can contribute to design history at large. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nika. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to unmute or you can uh, ask them in the chat as well. Um, I don't know what our screening room rules are too. Like, you, I don't know if there, there's some questions from there, but uh, I can also kick off with, with a question. Uh, as, as And thank you, by the way, for such a, it's, it's so, uh, obviously we've talked, there's been a lot of talking about history recently and about graphic design. Um, rarely, though, does, do people really talk about how graphic design itself encapsulates history in a particular way and like kind of holds it in a, in a, in a place. So um, this might be a little bit out of left field, but I'm curious what you think about the whole concept of timelessness, because like oftentimes as a designer, I'll be asked to make something timeless, which I think is an interesting ask. And it seems like a very modernist idea like have you thought about that or like what what are what's your what's your position on the timeless you know versus being of your time yeah it's a really interesting question it's almost easier to answer in terms of web design um craigslist comes to mind as something that is timeless because you know it was created in I think 1996 and it hasn't really changed form since then. Um, and it still works and it's very functional and it works in the way that the designer intended it to is as being this kind of pure community space that doesn't have any advertising on it. 
Um, and also it uses kind of the read-only aspects of HTML, which, you know, we add on videos and, and like other flashy things, but that has always worked until now. So I think about that and I think how a lot of people, when they say they want something timeless, they don't want something that looks like Craigslist, um, but that would be something that is very timeless to me. Um, but yeah, I, I do hear that a lot. I think I'd be curious to hear what you think, but I feel like when people want something timeless, they want something um, like kind of classic, I guess is the word that comes to mind or like rooted in like, a, like which is another kind of fluff word. It's like- Classy. <laughs> <laughs> it's rooted in legacies or something, but that's, I think it's kind of problematic, but I think in my experience, that's usually what people mean. What about for you? I mean, I, I often, I would never say this in a client meeting, but I often think that they want something that's already been validated uh, so that they don't have to risk making something that people won't like. Um, so when whenever I hear timeless, that's usually uh, that's usually what I hear. Like they worry that that if they make something that looks quote unquote too trendy, meaning like too much of its time, that it'll attract attention in a negative way that they don't they don't want to be associated with because mm -hmm. they want a safe they want to be safe, you know, safely timeless. But I I mean I I've always thought it was absurd because uh, you know in every gesture that you make everything because every tool we use every, you know everything is marked by its time. Like there's no uh, there's no chance of leaving, leaving it, thankfully. Yeah, and I think it should be that way. I mean, it's more honest to kind of represent something in the current time period so that in, in the future, when we look at it, we'll see it. And even if you're not, even if you're not super cognizant of it, that'll happen like you're describing because of the, the, the tools that we have, they, they just constantly change too. Other, other, other questions from our folks? I have. I also have a a place question for you too, which I guess has to do with the the time question. With, uh, in that, uh, the the idea of representing a place, you know, that doesn't exist anymore for the for the most part. Like, do you think about how graphic design? Because um, you started by thinking about, you know, with your personal history, but is it something that you'd like to bring into future projects? For example, just like thinking about how we make a place also exist in a way with uh, visual form. Hmm. I think that's a really interesting thought. I'm not sure that I've really explored that too much because I do think of um, like internet as kind of the great unifier in some ways. So there's, there's issues with that way of thinking, but I do think of how a lot of trends sort of evolve online or they start online and then they kind of come out off the screen. Um, for example, I'm working on a story right now about heart-shaped glasses, and, um, and they're actually a very popular fashion um, accessory with the non-binary community right now, but um, before it had this kind of history rooted in Lolita, which has, um, like, like the movie poster, for example, had uh, the actress Julian wearing them and kind of being suggestive, and it was rooted in this kind of, I don't know, problematic like child abuse situation. But the way it's being used now is not like that at all. It's very reclamatory and kind of embracing being able to adorn yourself as almost like an avatar and thinking about gender as something that's more fluid. And it's interesting because I think that really happened online. And in my story, I write about um, Lana Del Rey, who is still sort of using this kind of romantic notion of um, child abuse again, but like re rethinking mm -hmm. that and how it's kind of evolved um, past that into something that doesn't have that same connotation anymore. I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> that's what came to no, mind. No, but I mean, it gets, it also gets back to the whole timelessness question, which is that, a, a, you know, you have a symbol that means something in one time and then it means something different. Mm -hmm. in another time and which is which is super interesting uh i think so other questions anyone always full of questions over here maybe i'll ask one last question and then we can let everybody uh oh wait we have do we have another question here there's a dance there's a question all oh, right someone in the screening room <laughs> yes this one <laughs> Hey, Nika. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Good. Um, I was curious, I love the Russet project, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about 
like having these interests in these sort of like histories of the web and of like design on the web and how you find opportunities to bring those into projects with clients? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, well, I think it gets easier when you have more work because the more you kind of output and what, how you document the work that you have and you're talking about these things, people start to see that and then they're sort of expecting that from you because, you know, if you have your work represented totally removed of that and it feels more like a Squarespace template, for example, if people are not usually going to come to you to make something more innovative, they're going to make it come to you to make something more generic, I guess. Um, so I would say if it's something that interests you, being mindful of how you talk about your work when you have these opportunities and how you present yourself online can be one way of doing that. And then um, beyond that, I just try to, I don't know, I think it's just naturally what I'm interested in. So when I work on these projects that are more narrative driven or open ended to a concept, I really try to lean into that and kind of use it as part of my um, kind of process that happens instinctively. But that's what I would suggest. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions from the screening room or elsewhere online? Can I ask you an international question, different international okay. question? <laughs> sure. So you're, you're looking at the history of the internet and this will be the last one, I promise. You're looking at the history of the internet uh, your per own personal history with the internet throughout all this time. And uh, it strikes me now, like how, how American the internet is like that, that, you know, so much of it is in English, so much of it controlled by the U S uh, is this what you had expected, you know, back then. And can you imagine a future internet that is not like that? It was something I never really thought about, to be honest, um, because when I would visit my family in Yugoslavia, it was like the internet was so much slower then. Like I remember you would have to go to like an internet cafe, something like when it later on. And like, I think um, it wasn't until like I was in college or something when people, like everyone had a computer that had internet at home. So I think, and then when it was, because it was so slow, it was like trying to find the websites that were familiar to me already. And then I think that's what everybody else was doing because there was so much history um, built up that the, like the more American websites were just more prevalent. And so I don't think I really thought much of it other than like a, a nuisance that it was like harder to get online. <laughs> but, uh, so but I think um, now, like, especially after researching Serbian type and then seeing um, these different initiatives with different, um, well, not just Serbian writing, but like Korean and Arabic. And like, there's just all these more initiatives to have these different web typefaces that accommodate for more universal language support. And it still seems pretty early on to tell, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I think that if you can use these natural um, native languages online, I don't know why you wouldn't, especially because there's more options now, but I think it's probably gonna take a really long time to, to have it be more widespread. Great. Well, uh, if there if there are no other last questions, I want to say thank you to Nika for joining us today, and thanks for sharing, uh, especially just the this amazing personal history, 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 and also your your uh, your perspective on on what we do as designers within that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Friday. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.